All right, welcome back. Let's take a look at Napoleon in power now. And we're going to be picking up here in the year 1804. This is when something amazing happens. Maybe something good, maybe something bad, but something does happen in the year 1804. And we'll be taking it all the way to the fall, the final fall of Napoleon. He actually falls in 1814 and comes back in 1815 for one last desperate gamble and loses at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. But let's just talk about the good times here. Let's just focus on the good stuff. Um, Bonaparte in power, picking up in the year 1804. He's done all these great things, 1799 to 1804, all these great things. And then 1804, there were a couple of assassination attempts, and the French government agreed and voted to make him emperor, hereditary emperor, that the Bonaparte family will continue on. In other words, even if you assassinate Napoleon, that uh, the family will continue on, the Bonaparte family, and Bonaparte needs to have a son now. So he's Emperor Bonaparte. The coronation takes place on December 2nd, 1804, the coronation of Napoleon. He had the uh, Pope brought in, and he did not let the Pope crown him. The Pope, remember, a while back had, pound, had crowned uh, uh, Charlemagne, so Bonaparte does not let the Pope crown him. He crowns himself, and this is a famous painting by David of the crowning of Josephine. So... Uh, your new emperor is Napoleon and his wife, Josephine. This is when you can start calling him Napoleon. I've been calling him Bonaparte to this point. We start calling him Napoleon. In fact, he changes his signature from Napoleon Bonaparte to Napoleon, well, sometimes just the big capital N. So um, this is the big moment here, the coronation of him as emperor, because, you know, where do you stand on this? You know, he was a revolutionary. He was a Jacobin. And uh, does this betray the revolution? Many people say yes. Many people say no. This new French empire, this is the greatness of France. This is what France hopes to achieve. France hasn't uh, gone against the revolution. They're liberating people around Europe. Well, you know, when you have an emperor, you know, this is going to, he's a new noble, and he will start to ennoble the people around him, his friends and his, his co-workers. A new noble class comes up. It's not just him being made emperor, a whole new noble class. But you could argue, well, these are men who have shown merit. It's not based on blood. It's based on merit. Because the republic is gone. This is not a republic anymore. You know, there was a great moment when they got rid of their king, and now they brought back not just a king but an emperor. So the republic is gone. What about liberty? And Napoleon's argument and the people who make him emperor will argue this guarantees your liberty. This makes sure that, you know, an assassination of Napoleon will not bring back a, a king to turn back the clock. He will guarantee the revolution and your liberties. And then what about equality here? I thought we were all equal. Well, you know, there needs to be some reward. He would say there needs to be some reward for greatness. So you can rise out of your normal standing. But, you know... There's as many people love him for this. Uh, there's just as many people say he betrays the revolution. It's one of the great problems in history of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Does he betray the revolution or does he guarantee the revolution? Well, he is a military man here, and um, all of Europe is going to turn on him in 1804, and so he's got to go to war pretty much against all of Europe. He will create a new French armée. This is called the Grande Armée, which in French um, means Grand Army. So he, he's learned some things. He's learned some lessons in fighting Europe, and now he is going to take the show on the road. He gets to create his own army. The Grande Armée is a giant-sized army made up of small corps. And what are corps? You know, we still use these, these in our armies today. They're mini armies. So you have one big army made up of little mini armies, and uh, he will make them from sizes of 15,000 if he has a commander that he sort of trusts and a commander that he really trusts, up to 40,000 minutes. So they kind of vary in size, um, not really standardized. They are made up of infantry, they're made up of artillery, and they're made up of cavalry, all three of these branches in this mini army. So they can fight independently for 24 hours while the other corps come to support. In fact, that's how this works. It works in close support. These little mini armies will move, and again, lightning speed. 20 miles, 30 miles a day, flying at the enemy, but in close support of each other. When one of the corps runs into the enemy, the other corps will swarm, not just, you know, play by the old rules of warfare, but they will come swarming in to surround the enemy. And they can also, fu also function independently. If he needs to send a, a small corps off to do something independently, he can trust these guys. And again, each of the corps is under a marshal. Who are these marshals? His trusted friends, men that he's seen in combat. Um, men that he's 
come through the Army with, 1795, 96, 97, 98, 99, guys that have shown themselves to be great commanders, and he, he moves them up the ladder. He's moved up, and he moves them up. And they are his new nobility. They will be where, carrying noble titles and land holdings and will become very wealthy. So uh, it's with this Grand Armée that he conquers Europe. I'm not going to go into great detail or any detail really about his conquest, but in 1805 he conquers the Austrians. 1806 he conquers the Prussians. 1807 he battles the Russians all the way over to Russia. And um, battling the Russians, he kind of has some stalemate battles there with them. And they will come to a treaty. You know, Russians really never need to surrender, but they come to a treaty with Napoleon. This is called the Treaty of Tilsit. This is really important that he and the Tsar of Russia are going to come to a, an agreement to share Europe. They sit down together, actually on a raft in the middle of a river, and uh, talk, and they come to the agreement that Britain is the enemy. That's the cause of all this, that it's Britain on their little island has been paying the Austrians, paying the Prussians, paying the Russians to fight against the French Republic, or now against the French Empire. And so Britain is the enemy. Well, how do you defeat that little island? Well, we go back to that trade how do you block their trade? And uh, Bonaparte comes up with a thing called the Continental System, which is a trade embargo. Little island, all of Europe, let's just blockade them. Let's not trade with them. Instead of us blockading England, which we can't do, we'll blockade the, the coastline from English ships. So um, that's sort of successful. And uh, next thing they agree is, well, we need to split Europe among us, between the two of us. And uh, Russians will handle the eastern side of Europe. Uh, Bonaparte at this time had, a, had a, uh, a Polish mistress and she convinces him to put a new Poland on the map. So there's a Duchy of Warsaw that's created and Russia will take everything east of the Duchy of Warsaw. Uh, Russians are not real happy with the Polish situation but they will stand with it right now. And so everything east of the Duchy of Warsaw belongs to uh, the Russians. That includes Finland, that includes the Black Sea, Alexander will wage war against the Turks now. What does France control? Western Europe. And he pretty much has all of that except Spain and Portugal. And this is what's going to get him in trouble. Um, I just want to point out to you, we always talk about Bonaparte being an egomaniac. Um, when this agreement is made, the Tsar will attack Finland. He'll be waging war around the Black Sea against the Turks. And um, Bonaparte will be heading into Spain and Portugal. Um, here's the meeting, little drawing of the meeting between these two young rulers, Napoleon and Alexander sitting down and making a new Europe, uh, agreeing that England is the enemy. Well, this is where Bonaparte is going to start moving against Spain. Spain actually had been working with him, but he just can't stand them, looking at their royal family. These are the Bourbons, going back to the War of Spanish Succession. The Bourbons have taken the throne of Spain, and they have done a terrible job through the 1700s, and Bonaparte is ready to get rid of them. Um, in 1808, he will invite them to come to France, where he will imprison them. Um, it will capture this Bourbon family, this disaster of a family, and he will force them to sign abdications, and he will send Spain a new king. His older brother, Joseph Bonaparte, referred to as the gentle Bonaparte, the nice guy, will go to Spain to teach them the new way. And again, this is the Spain that's pretty much been in a time capsule since 1492. Um, and now we'll be introduced to the new ways of the world, new ways of Europe, uh, an enlightened government. And it does not go well. On May 2nd, 1808, Madrid rises up. The people grab arms and knives and begin attacking the French garrison. And then the French come back in on May 3rd and execute the a lot of the population. And it just goes bad from there. This becomes known as the Spanish ulcer. Bonaparte's dealing with the Spanish. He can never figure this out, how to deal with the Spanish, how to encourage them to grasp the new world, and they just won't do it. In fact, the Spanish turned to a new sort of warfare, uh, warfare of civilians against an army. You know, you're trying to chase an army down. It's not them, it's the civilians. And this is a new sort of warfare. In fact, uh, this is where the word is coined, guerrilla warfare, guerrilla warfare, the warfare of small warriors, people who come out at night and with a knife. How do you fight them? They don't come out in the open field. They hide in the, in the hills. They hide in towns and all kinds of atrocities on both sides, atrocities of Spanish guerrillas against the French, and of course French reprisals against the guerrillas and, and maybe innocent towns. Anyway, Bonaparte, this will never heal, this ulcer that just drips blood. 500,000 Frenchmen will be sent in there to hold down Spain. Can't you just leave it alone? Well, by 1810, 
with Bonaparte still tied down in Spain. Um, he decides that uh, he needs to have an heir. He has had a son via that Polish mistress of his, and so he decides that he, he can have children. She, Josephine can't, and so he will decide to divorce her at this point. Um, you know, she swoons and cries, but uh, she then helps him with his next marriage. His first marriage proposal is to Tsar Alexander for one of his sisters, a, a Romanov princess of Tsar Alexander, a sister of Tsar Alexander, and the word comes back, no, that the Russian princesses, princesses are not available to him. And of course, he's flabbergasted by this. How can my good buddy not help me out, not want to join our families together? And their second choice falls to a Habsburg princess, uh, an archduchess, and they will contact Francis I of Austria, who will have an, a young princess, archduchess, ready to go. And Bonaparte gets his new wife, an 18-year-old archduchess, Marie Louise. And again, this is France. Do not have a good history with these Austrian archduchesses. Um, she'll be welcome, though. She will not have the same stigma of Marie Antoinette. And she uh, will meet Bonaparte, and they get along really well together. He is in his 40s. She is 18. And um, he wines her, he dines her, and, uh, of course, he, he beds her, his new wife. And she is pregnant almost immediately. And then nine months later, she has a son, a boy, who will be named the king of Rome. So here she is with her new baby, and the baby grows up to be a healthy boy, and everything should be fine here. Napoleon has his son, he has his heir, he had to continue his empire, and he's at the height of his power here. He owns all of Europe. He's divided, there's the line right there pretty much. Russians take this side, France takes this side. He's missing a few pieces. Portugal, he can't take very well. Spain's still up for grabs. He's missing a couple of islands here. He can't get to that England. But he pretty much owns everything else. You know, you should be able to just manage at this point. Life should be good here in your 40s. Just watch your boy grow up. Go out and play ball with him in the backyard or something, or soccer. Um, and the problem comes up, Russia. The thorn in his side um, beyond the Spanish ulcer is about Russia. In 1809, he had fought a war, and the Russians didn't help him. In fact, they actually sent troops toward the Duchy of Warsaw. In 1810, the marriage proposal came, and uh, the Tsar refused to help him and marry with his family. In 1811, the Tsar reopens trade with Great Britain and just can't let that stand. By 1812, Napoleon is ready for war. He's felt betrayed. This is that Italian thing again, that vendetta. That Bonaparte just can't let it go. He just cannot sit down and control Western Europe while Eastern Europe is turning against him. He will decide to invade Russia in the year 1812. He moves his Grand Armée to the east, half a million men, again, 100,000 or more tied down in Spain still, but many of them now moving over to Russia. This army is not completely French. Again, I want to remind you that uh, the rest of Europe pretty much cooperates with Napoleon. I mean, he's running a much better system than they had. But so half the army is French, quarter of a million Frenchmen, quarter of a million allied contingents, and these will be from all over Europe. You name it, there will be uh, even some Spanish troops there. There will be Italian troops. There will be Austrian, Prussian troops from all over Europe um, forming contingents to go into Russia with him. He invades Russia on June 23rd. That's about the same time Hitler invaded in uh, 1941. But let's not mention those two guys in the same sentence. These are completely two different things here when Napoleon invades Russia as opposed to Hitler's invasion of Russia. Um, what's Napoleon doing here? Well, he wants a great battle. You know, nobody wants to go marching deep into Russia. He expects that the Russians will come out and fight him. There'll be a great battle, and all will be well. Well, the Russians don't play that game. The Russians will retreat deeper and deeper into Russia, and the French will pursue and pursue. And the Russians scorch the earth as you retreat into Russia, they will just burn everything in front of them. Now let me remind you, the way the French armies move is they are used to liberating people who then give them food. There will be none of that. The peasants will be running off to the, the hills, and the Russian army will be scorching the earth in front of the French army. So this is going to be a very different sort of warfare here. As Bonaparte leaves the Duchy of Warsaw and begins marching east further and further, 500 miles deep into Russia. This is the invasion of Russia in 1812. Um, the summer heat was unbelievably hot. You know, we always think of Russia as cold, but well, it can be hot. This summer of 1812 was unbelievable. Soldiers are just being exhausted along the roads. 
horses dropping dead along the roads as the French push deeper and deeper into Russia. What about the food? Well, the food's got to be brought up from behind. The further you march, the longer it takes to get that food up there. You know, that supply line, that one road of supply, you know, if it gets blocked for a couple of days, you're going to be starved to death. So supply is always going to be a problem. Supply wagons pushing 500 miles all the way to Moscow eventually. The Russians don't give battle. At one point, they actually turned around and were going to maybe fight at Smolensk about halfway in, but then they, uh, the Russian commanders couldn't get along, and so they'll continue to retreat. This is a famous graph of Napoleon's invasion of Russia. It actually shows um, the physical geography, and then it shows time, and it shows Napoleon's army, the strength of his army here as he goes in here. By the time they reach Smolensk, he's down to about half of his strength. Now, one of the myths of this, as you look at this graph, is you think, well, the French are dying along the way. They're really not. As you're marching deeper into, into Russia, you've got to leave troops along here. You've got a supply line of wagons, and so you've got to leave troops. As you march all the way to Moscow, you're having to leave men along the way to guard the supply lines. He eventually makes it all the way to Moscow, and as you can see here, the number of men who actually get to Moscow is pretty slim. Um, there's actually a battle outside of Moscow um, called the Battle of Borodino. And uh, there's Napoleon watching the battle. Um, it's actually kind of a sad battle. He didn't try any finagling here. He just sent his troops smashing into the Russians, uh, just a bloodbath of a battle. But he does win the battle. And then he enters Moscow to find it in flames, the city in flames. It's the Russians who've done it. The Russians have actually opened their prisons and um, given all their uh, crazy prisoners uh, a, a torch and say, hey, go to work. So uh, the, they burn their own city down. Bonaparte con or tries to contact Tsar Alexander. Okay, I've got your capital city here. It's in flames. You did it. And uh, you should surrender now. And there is no response from the Russians. They just pull east of Moscow and no negotiations. Well, it's uh, in November, about November 1st, that the Bonaparte decides to leave Russia as the snow starts to fall and they've got to march 500 miles to get out of there. This is going to be the destruction, winter destruction. Half the horses died on the summer going in. The other half will die and be eaten on the way out. And the Grand Armée will dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. Let me show you that graph again to see you marching out here from Moscow, trying to get out of here, and only a trickle of, tr of French troops will make it out. A lot of the contingents actually made it out. The ones that he left along the way here were able to get out pretty easily. But uh, the ones who went all the way, <laughs> your chances of surviving it all the way out were pretty slim. So it's uh, the destruction of Napoleon's Grand Armée in Russia.